Uh, interesting morning to you. We've been talking about the broken energy market. And Chris in Newbury uh, says that uh, my guest, Alex Crowley, former Downing Street advisor, hello, Alex. Hello. Is talking nonsense. Well, that's, I mean, that's, uh, that's always a possibility. Um, if you own the resources under your feet, you don't need to sell it on any open market. This is uh, us discussing, you know, if we did have a nationalised energy system, uh, energy market, why we couldn't create our own energy, sell it to us first, and then I suppose any left over going on the open market. You might want to, but you can keep as much as you want at the cost uh, of production. All Middle Eastern oil producing countries own their own oil and gas and are richer than we will ever be. A Tory advisor who once again doesn't understand how industry works, says Chris in Newbury. I mean, okay, aside from you being sort of talking nonsense in any of the, 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 the personal stuff, you know, does, he does seem to have a point that a lot of people can't seem to get their head around why it is, if we owned our own energy, why we couldn't sell our own at a certain price cap. Someone else has pointed out France has capped their energy price increase at 4%. Why can't we do that? Um, and then sell the rest on the open market. Yeah, look... In, a, in this utopian ideal where you owned everything and you had complete control... No, no, yes, no, it's not a utopian it? idea. It's no, just a fair can, comment. Because, it, because it, first of all, by the way, it, uh, 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 under current rules, it would actually be illegal for us to, uh, for example, do things like fracking, which would create our own secure energy supply that we could supply to ourselves first at a lower cost and a higher cost to the rest of the world. So this this idea that we, we, can, we can even do that at the moment uh, is wrong. Uh, and also, you, you, I, I come back to the point, even if you owned 100% of everything and you could control everything, you're still subject to the global supply and demand. It has an influence. Uh, it has a lesser influence, but it still has an influence. You're talking about the influence on, say, production costs or the cost of equipment or the cost uh, of inflation, um, uh, materials, uh, shipping, all these kind of things. Uh, but the government could, could bear some of those costs more easily. I realise that you're, that's going to be the tax As you know, the government does not bear costs. Yes, the it's, it's the taxpayer, tax absolutely. <laughs> but it's easier for them to do that rather than... I mean, a lot of people would listen to this saying, well, look, I'd rather the government subsidise an industry that we own for us to have lower prices than the government subsidise energy companies so getting the money. When was the last time the government owned the energy industry outright? I think it was the 70s. 70s. How, how did energy bills go back then? Not particularly well. Yeah, but that was because there was only one. And also, I mean, if we did nationalise everything, I would want caveats that people couldn't strike, which is very Thatcherite. Ah, now, now we're now we're getting onto some uh, fertile territory. Yeah, because I, 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 I had a debate yesterday. I was doing a TV debate, and I said they said we'll nationalise the railways. And what I didn't say, and I forgot to say afterwards, was. Exactly that. Uh, you know, great. You know, the, the railways are a, again an, another privatisation, which I think is is a little weird because you don't have the concept of competition in the railways. Well, no, you can't. No, you, no. Can't, you know, the, 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 when HS2 opens and if another line opens, great. If there were three railways I could choose from, yeah. that's competition. But the problem is, if we owned it all outright, we would there'd be strikes every week, and I would want the caveat: fine, we'll buy it all back, but you can't go on strike. Yeah, make strikes uh, for nationalised industries illegal. That could be an interesting combination of kind of Corbynism and Thatcherism. But that's in what we would need. It. Yes. I think we'd need that because immediately the unions would say, aha, now the government own it, we can fleece them. Well, and and, and so you'd need them. to have a balance of some, some uh, protections for the consumer that they wouldn't end up shafted that way, instead, which is what happened in the 70s. Yeah, exactly. um, all right, let's talk about the... Uh, story about trans charities. What's that all about? So uh, it, we we see in the Telegraph today, um, and this is a, this is a fairly um, common practice out in, in Whitehall land, is that uh, uh, a big established uh, uh, charitable organisations uh, like uh, Sport England, for example, will get money from the government to, to do all the things they need to do. But then those organisations will then give their own grants to much smaller organisations that receive a lot less scrutiny. And we see revealed today 
uh, that uh, I think the Sport England and, and, uh, is one example uh, of where it is making grants to controversial uh, transgender organisations. Uh, such organisations have uh, attracted controversy for, uh, for example, going into schools, going to primary schools uh, and trying to sort of indoctrinate young kids that, that perhaps they're in the wrong gender uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, it, it, the story here today is, is shining a bit of a light on that um, and, and it reveals something that we should all be concerned about, which is that we have uh, small organisations with extreme ideologies going into schools and being paid by the taxpayer to do it. Um, uh, now, first of all, uh, we all know that, uh, of course, schools need to be politically neutral uh, in everything that they do in, in, inside their, their, their walls. Um, uh, this kind of stuff veers way beyond that, um, and, and it's it's a serious issue of safeguarding. When does education and information become indoctrination? Because there's been a lot about the LGBT lessons in schools, huge protests from what I would call extremists in places like Birmingham yeah. against that. I have no problem with a child at an appropriate age being told that gay people exist. Mm -hmm. Nothing beyond that, just that, you know, some people fall in love. Um, around love, this is. You know, I wouldn't have it in anything prurient or anything like that, that, that two men might fall in love, two women might fall in love, man and a woman might fall in love. That's, because that's what education is, it's a fact. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I have a massive problem as well with children, again, at an appropriate age, is my caveat, being told, look, there are some people who have um, gender identity that's different to how they are born. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At an appropriate age, because that's a fact, that, that is something that happens. Whether you believe it or not, all the stuff beyond it, that is something that happens. It's when a child who might not be the norm, in inverted commas, when it comes to perhaps a boy who likes dolls or a girl who is what you would have called a tomboy it's when it's sort of medicalized or they're told that that, that they are 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 well i don't know it's when it becomes something more sinister around that that's when i have a problem so i mean look i'm a parent and and i think and i think most parents uh, completely accept that, that when it comes to these issues, information is power. Yes. And and I'm a very strong believer that there should be no mysteries around these the, the, these issues that they will have to confront in adulthood, uh, and they should know about all of these things because that you know they're, they're they're all part of the human experience, uh, and it's really important. And you know my own p position is if somebody feels that, that they are in the wrong gender, then then you know I, I believe in freedom. Yeah. It's actually go out very, there and, very Tory because it's, go out there and be it's who nothing to, be. to do with the state. Be who you want to be. It, 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 it's entirely an individual no, I, I, I'm so with you on that. Individual choice. Well, I never understood why gay marriage was proposed by so many Tories, but I think, well, actually, yeah, it's the yeah. most Tory thing in the world well, because exactly. you're saying the state has nothing to do with whom I marry. Well, also, you're extending the institution of marriage, which yeah. is a wonderful thing. But um, the, the problem comes when, for example, these kind of charities go into schools. And the starting point is fair, which is this... Uh, this is, trans, this is the transgender issue, and this is, this is what some people go through, and you should know about that. That's fair enough. Where it becomes a problem is where they start to convince young kids. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a, a, you know, a girl who, a, a little girl who sometimes likes to, to, to dress as a boy and vice versa. They're suddenly go in, going in there and saying, oh, well, this, you, you have this gender dysphoria thing. You have it right now. It's when... It's when Gender non-conformity is, is, is peddled as gender dysphoria. Exactly, and then they say, well, you need to make some changes. I, I agree. We're going to take you to a clinic, uh, and we're going to start you on some puberty and, and blocking. The thing is, it's all well-intentioned. I actually think it is well-intentioned. Mm. It's, 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 you know, like, well, I've spoken about this a lot. When I first knew I was gay, for a few months, I was like, well, that must be nice to think I want to be a girl. And I was convinced I wanted to be That's a, good point. a girl. And I didn't, but I just just confused about what it was that what I was supposed to be because I didn't know but about the things. ideological extremists now go to young kids and teenagers who who, who who are gay basically and they say no you're not gay you want you're, you're trans gender. exactly and and, 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 and hang on sorry how, how many years of gay rights have we had to have we, have we had to try struggle for and, and that's now just being swept away I agree and also you have uh, people saying well look if, if you are a, a, a gay man or woman and you don't fancy 
someone who has transitioned who still have the body parts of their previous sexual identity, then you are transphobic. Well, I mean, that's, that's the complete opposite of what people who are gay are for. for. It is absurd. Yeah. That's, that's what it is. It is. Uh, and that's fine. You can be absurd, but don't make the taxpayer pay for it. But also, I think, and yeah, I think that's a very, very <laughs> fair comment. <laughs> Anyone can be absurd if they want to, but it's a very fair comment. There needs to be a solution that respects the lives and the role and the identity of trans people. And protects kids. And, but also protects children. And it's one of those really difficult stories where there is this clash. Alex, we've got to leave it there. Really good to have you. We must get you back on uh, you. again. In the next hour is Meghan Markle dishonest. Well, that's what we'll explore here on Talk TV.